Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome to New Books and Economics, a podcast channel from the New Books Network. I'm Peter Lawrenson, an associate professor of economics at the University of San Francisco. My guest today is Professor Ben Ho, an associate professor of economics at Vassar College. We're going to discuss his new book, Why Trust Matters, An Economist's Guide to the Ties That Bind Us. Ben, welcome. Thanks, thanks for coming Peter. to the show. Yeah, thanks, Peter. It's great to be here. So um, to kick it off, I think, you know, for a lot of people, uh, they might think that trust is kind of, you know, what's an economist doing talking about trust? You'd think of trust as kind of the domain of psychology or maybe sociology. So, so where is trust in economics? Why, why should an economist bother to study trust? Uh, and what is distinctive about how economists uh, approach this topic? Yeah, exactly. There's two parts of that question. One is that trust really underlies all of our economic transactions. You may not think about it, but when you go to the store and buy something, or you're listening to a podcast, or you purchase a song, you, there's a lot of trust involved in that transaction, right? You trust that the person that the person will give you a good product. You trust that the, your money or, or your credit card will work. You trust that the legal system will protect you in case anything goes wrong. Um, and all this trust just happens behind the scenes, and economists, for the most part, even don't think about it very much. And and so I want, want to sort of like, you know, highlight the importance of trust in economics. And then the other part of that question is, well, OK, fine. So maybe trust is important for economics, but what can economics teach us about trust? And there I think it's the rigor of our mathematical modeling. It's the, you know, it's our ability to sort of like take really complicated ideas like trust that have so many different facets and to really boil it down into core key principles. And so to me, I think trust is a belief. And we have a lot of mathematics about studying beliefs, things like, you know, Bayes' theorem that help us understand these beliefs. And that's what I do. Right. So I use these mathematical theorems. I use experiments in the lab. I use field data and econometrics to basically illuminate, you know, the economist view of how trust operates. Okay, so so already you've gotten it. You've mentioned a term Bayes' theorem that like any economist will will take for granted, but then uh, maybe a you know, your average New York Times reader who, who might be listening to this um, would, would not. So, so what's Bayes' theorem? And, and, let, and tell me, like, what, what's Bayes' theorem have to do? What does this theorem have to do with trust? Yeah, that's a great question. I only used it because it's been in the news a lot recently, right? Um, especially in the context of COVID-19 and the pandemic and epidemiology. There's all these articles about this equation that everybody should know. But I agree, it's probably not super well known. It's basically just an equation for how we should respond to new information. Um, I mostly use it in the context of signaling. And so um, I think the most the, the context of signaling that most people are familiar with is just a peacock's feather, right? So biologists have sort of well explained that the reason why peacocks have these elaborate feathers is to signal how evolutionarily fit they are, right? These feathers are actually really bad for the peacock. It makes them more, more vulnerable to predators. It's like sort of heavy to carry around, but they do it as a way to sort of convey information to the peahens that they are going to be a good mate. And the way ma- the mathematics of signaling works is that we could basically look at these interactions between, say, peacock feathers and peahen mating and, you know, boil it down to an equation. What is my belief? What is the probability that you are going to be a good mate? And Bayes' rule is just a formula that lets me calculate precisely how my belief should change in the presence of new information. So when it comes to trust, you know, trust is my belief that you are a good person to work with, that you are a reliable partner. And that belief is a probability between zero and one. And I receive information about that belief. And, you know, economists use Bayes' rule to understand what, you know, what what the the factors that drive what what makes trust go up and down. So what would be an example of a of a costly, you know, I've heard it heard about, you know, costly signals with like Peacock's revolution. Okay, so the fact that, you know, if you see someone who can who can kind of evolutionarily afford to have this fancy tail and still somehow manages to like not get eaten, then it must be a pretty fit peacock. Um, or, you know, if uh, you know, I see like my uh let's say tech bro friends want to get their, their new Tesla. And by the fact that they can afford a Tesla and not go bankrupt, that says that they're pretty good at, you know, being an economic provider. And maybe also because they chose the Tesla, they're like, you know, indicating some kind of affiliation to, you know, being concerned about climate change. And so that, that, you know, says something about their character that uh, a person who didn't have money or didn't care about climate change might not be willing to say, um, what is what is something um, in the context of trust? What would be an example of a, of a signal there? 
Yeah, that's perfect, Peter. The classic example of signaling in economics is exactly like signaling your wealth, right? That goes back to Thorsten Veblen and conspicuous consumption and how we tend to buy things like fancy watches or big houses just to signal just how wealthy we are to other people. For me, I'm interested in how we signal our trustworthiness to other people. And in particular, my area of economics research is how we apologize, right? So an, an, an apology happens after trust has been broken because somebody made a mistake and you apologize to restore trust to signal that you are indeed a trustworthy person despite the mistakes you've made. And one of the theorems, this is my dissertation, sort of show that in order for an apology to be effective, it has to be a costly signal, right? That this just goes to standard signaling theory, that in order for a peacock's tail to be effective, it has to be more costly. In order for an, uh, an apology to be effective, it has to be costly. Um, so a, a recent experiment I ran along these lines was a study I did with Uber. Um, so Uber has this problem where if Uber if an Uber ride you take is late, people are less likely to come back, right? And this costs Uber money. And so they want to know, can an apology restore trust after a late ride? So we did an experiment where after for 1.5 million Uber customers that received a late ride, we randomized the kinds of apologies we sent them. And the main finding confirmed what my other studies have said, that, you know, that apology has to be costly. In particular, the most effective apology from Uber was a $5 coupon. And that if Uber just apologized in a cheap way, right, where they just, you know, sort of made an excuse or just didn't really apologize, that actually could do more harm to Uber's reputation, more harm to the trust people have in Uber than no apology at all. Right? So the best apology is one that involves a real cost, and the cost could be tangible, like a coupon, or it could be intangible, like a, a cost to your reputation. Um, but those are the kinds of costs I study um, in terms of costs that restore trust. So, so that reminds me of like, yeah, the uh, the classic, uh, yeah, so it links with, as you well know, I guess, like the sort of psychological or, you know, uh, uh, couples counseling kind of story about like, what is a good apology? If you just say apology, like, I'm really sorry that you misunderstood me and you felt bad, then that doesn't really, you know, take, accept any blame. And so there's no kind of personal cost to me as the so-called apologizer um, in, in making that. But it's when you actually like take blame or take steps to remedy the, uh, the harm that you, um, that you've, you've done to some person that you're really, um, you're really incurring a cost and therefore showing that you actually care about the relationship in some, in some longer term sense. Yeah, exactly. Um, in my research, I classify apologies into five different types of costs. And the cheap apologies are often the most dangerous, right? So the worst apology is, I am sorry that you feel offended, or I'm sorry that that offended you, right? That takes no blame at all. Um, and you may want to have a cheap apology, right? Because it is costly to apologize. You may not want to pay that cost, but those apologies are most likely to backfire. Other apologies that are cheap are basically apologies that make excuses that shift the blame to other people. Um, the apologies that the, the apologies that tend to work better are ones that you know in, incur a, curse, a personal cost, either a monetary cost like the coupon with Uber, or a reputational cost. So the two kinds of costly apologies I study: one is an admission of your own incompetence. Um, a lot of research sort of shows that people that apologize are liked more, right? They're seen as more trustworthy, but they're also seen as incompetent. Um, my favorite experiment was this experiment done by Laura Tiedens at Stanford. She made two videos of Bill Clinton talking about Monica Lewinsky. This is near the end of the Clinton administration where people were upset about his affair. Um, and one video, in one video, Clinton sounded angry. In the other video, Clinton sounded apologetic. And while all the people that heard these videos thought that Clinton should sound more apologetic and wanted him to sound more apologetic, it was the people that saw the angry Clinton who thought he was a better president, who were more likely to vote for him again. And so, you know, an apology can have a cost by making you look like look incompetent, look like a potentially bad president, but it would work to restore trust. Um, and then the other class of costly apology are promises to do better in the future. So this is like in the Uber case, if Uber apologized and promised that it will you know, try harder in the future, that actually was an effective apology unless they screwed up again. Right. So the downside of making a promise to do better is that if you do screw up a second time or a third time, then we're actually going to punish you worse compared to no apology at all. Um, and so that was backed up in the Uber data and also backed up in the game theory models I based the experiment on. Right. No, that's great that you can you can do that. Uh, you know, obviously, this is the world of world of big data. And if you can cooperate with a, a company that's willing to let you uh, experiment on their their customers, um, then that there's there's some amazing things you you do so um so how what other kinds of uh methods have you used to to explore um apologies or or trust 
um, more broadly in your research or, or things that other people have done that you found impressive aside. So this is kind of a classic field experiment. Um, what else, what else can you do? Yeah, there's basically three main approaches I take to looking at these questions. One is um, game theory, which is mathematical models using things like the Bayes rule that I mentioned earlier. One is field experiments, like the Uber experiment. Um, and then actually there's two other ones. One is lab experiments, right? So we've done lots of experiments in the laboratory. That's where we sort of create a computer game based on the mathematical models. And then we have subjects come in and play these games. So these are sort of simulated trust exercises. Um, in one experiment, so there's a classic trust game that everyone uses. Um, we we want to know what's the impact of um, untrustworthy behavior on future trust. And one thing we find is that untrustworthy behavior takes three rounds of trustworthy behavior to cancel it out, right? That if you do something untrustworthy, you have to be good for three times in a row um, to sort of restore trust after one example of untrustworthy behavior. Um, the other kind of study I do is just econometric studies. These are studies where we look at data that's already out there. Um, one econometric study that I did is looks at um, medical malpractice. So doctors have this thing where they're told not to apologize because an apology opens them up to lawsuits. So I looked at the impact of laws affecting whether an apology can be used in the court of law against doctors. And I found that these laws that encourage apologies basically reduce the number of lawsuits and made lawsuits settle quicker. Um, and so that is a real world example of how apologies have big economic impacts. Uh, a more recent study I did looked at stock market prices, where I looked at what's the impact of a corporate apology after a chemical spill on stock market prices. Um, and there we found actually interesting results. We found that actually the costly apologies were the worst for stock market prices, which sort of makes sense, right? And a, a costly apology makes the apologizer look incompetent. They have to pay some money. Um, and so that may be good for reputation, but it's bad for you know shareholders who cared the most about the firm's competence. Well, but if you don't, you want, I mean, even if you're a company, I guess the idea is you do want people to trust you. So like, you know, the, the classic example that like a, a million MBAs have studied is the, the Johnson and Johnson Tylenol um, poisoning <laughs> thing where they, well, I guess they, the idea is that they responded well, I suppose the question is, did they respond in a way that, you know, said that they screwed up? It seems like you, you want to convince, like, especially if it's something like, you know, a product quality issue or like a safety issue, then you want to, you want it seems like the shareholder should also care. I mean, sometimes, you know, as you know, well, like sometimes there's kind of an arbitrary divide maybe between like the shareholders want one thing, but the customers want the other thing. But like, if your customers don't trust you, they're not going to give you any money and your shareholders won't make any money. So you do have to get the, have the customers on board. So, so don't apologies help in that dimension? 100%, right? So I, I often am called to advise companies on how they should apologize for different situations. And what I tell them is there's no right way, right? Every type of apology has its pros, has, has its cons, right? So an apology could make you look incompetent, could, but could make you look more trustworthy. Um, and so I'm just trying to help them unpack when they should use e either. There is no right answer, right? There is no easy answer when it comes to apologies and trust. It's basically just balancing your priorities and balancing what your customers care about. Right. Yeah, I guess that's the that's the the key in a sense. If if there were the easy answer, everyone would choose it, and and they wouldn't need a consultant. But the the reason they're perplexed is because there's uh, there's not there's not an easy solution that will get them everything they want. Um, although I've heard sometimes that people find uh, economists and other consultants who who uh, respond that way uh, kind of annoying because you know they're looking for you to like say here's the right answer, and maybe there's maybe their MBA consultant will just come in and be like, boom, we've got the right answer. We did a study, and then the economist comes in and says, well, on the one hand, on the other hand, and, you know, they right. may have there's a classic a complaint about wanting right? the one-handed like, economist, right? Yeah, ex precisely. Yeah, yeah there's... <laughs> right, I think the, the, um, the story goes like Harry, Harry Truman says, bring me a one-handed economist, because he was tired of economists always saying, on the one hand this, on the one hand that. So, yeah, 100%. Yeah, uh, but but of course, yeah. If you ever find a one-handed economist, they're they're a flim-flam artist, and so <laughs> something to bear in mind... Uh, uh, for anyone who's looking at hiring an economist. Um, all right. So, so this was a lot about, so, so this uh, research on apologies that you, you and I have done is, is, is amazing and you know, a great way to, um, you know, get more, uh, well, both, both, you know, the practice illustrates the practical application of it, you know, for I mean, obviously malpractice, uh, for, for companies trying to, you know, have, uh, maximize shareholder value and keep their customers happy. Um, uh, but, and that, that's sort of more about um, the aspect of trust, where I trust you because I think you're a good person, you know, in the jargon, you're a good type. 
And so that that's where the Bayes rule thing comes in. It's sort of like, you know, just as, you know, we've all been at whatever, to whatever degree, you know, trying to learn how Bayes rule works when we think about like, okay, what are the probabilities that you, you know, are going to get sick given that you had this, you know, an, an infection and given that you had a vaccination and stuff like that. So Bayes, we can apply Bayes rule in that context. So it's like this kind of binary sick or not. And in this case, or, um, or, you know, what are the odds if I see someone wearing a mask that they've gotten a vaccination and I think my view perversely is that like the more, the, if they're wearing a, ma- a, a mask, they probably are also showing that they're the kind of person who would also get a vaccination. Um, but <laughs> right. Uh, which contrary to what you might think. Um, so, but anyway, that's all about like your type, but what, what about the other aspect of trust, which is just like, you know, it's not just about picking good people from bad people. Like, you know, everyone's tempted to, you know, cut corners sometimes and, or, you know, you can't, maybe you can't figure out who to trust. So um, how do we, uh, what, are, what are some of the other things in our society we, we do that help uh, facilitate uh, trust, like all the examples you gave in the beginning? Yeah, actually, there's basically, so the theme of the book actually is there's two ways to facilitate trust, right? One is finding the, the right people who are trustworthy. And the second is building institutions that make trustworthy interactions possible. Um, so the book actually sort of starts with the history of human civilization as a history of how we built institutions to learn to trust one another. So I start sort of in like the African steppe where, you know, you have hunter gatherers and they are trying to, and and they've, you know, they've gone out to go hunt and you've, you know, you've brought down a wildebeest or something and you're trying to decide who do you want to share that food with? Um, And so ideally you would share the food with someone who would share the food back with you, right? You'd share the food food with somebody who's trustworthy. And, you know, luckily we're good at keeping track of trustworthiness, right? You know, our brain has actually evolved to sort of keep track of the trustworthiness of around 150 people. That's called Dunbar's number, um, but named after an anthropologist named Robin Dunbar, who studies different primate species and finds that like the size of of different, you know, uh, animal primate groupings is based on the size of the neocortex cortex. And he predicts that humans should basically be able to live in groups of up to 150, um, mostly because that's the number of people we could determine are trustworthy or not. Um, To get the bigger groupings, we're going to need something else. We're going to need institutions to help us along the way. So I document the rise of different institutions like religion, like rule of law, like merchant guilds, each of these things builds in rules and norms and systems that makes trustworthy interaction possible, even if you're not sure about the trustworthiness of the other person. Some of this is just ways to identify who's trustworthy and who's not. Others are just systems of punishments of punishment and rewards to make trustworthy behavior more likely. Um, and that's where the book goes and sort of looks at how the, the, this two part this two part way of ensuring trust, basically identifying trustworthy people and creating incentives for trustworthy behavior, can be seen in all the institutions we see, you know, in the world in the modern world today. Okay, so we, we've why don't you give us an example of one of those and uh, and just talk it through it talk us through it in more detail. Yeah, I think um, one example that I think is really interesting is thinking about the future of trust and where the future of trust is going. Um, when I started this book, blockchain was like the super hype thing. And the idea of blockchain, if you may not realize this because people talk about blockchain in the context of Bitcoin, but the idea is to basically take things that relied on trust in the past, like banking transactions, and replace them with a computer algorithm to basically make a trustless system, is what they say. And the idea there is to sort of create an institution that doesn't require trusting anybody in particular. It just requires having a a system that automatically handles all the transactions for you. So that's an institution that sort of takes care of the trust problem. But the other innovation that's happened in recent years is this thing that's been happening in China called the social credit score system. So if you think about it, the bank currently already determines your trustworthiness for, you know, for returning a loan in this thing called a credit score, where it just sort of observes your income, it observes your past loan behavior, um, and basically decides how trustworthy are you in terms of, you know, getting a loan from the bank. So China has extended this idea to a social a social credit system where it's going to basically keep track of your trustworthiness based on a whole range of other behaviors in terms of like, do you jaywalk or not? Did you pay off? You know, are you divorced or not? Um, did you make, you know, did you make your school payments on time? Um, and the idea here is to have a number that can identify just how trustworthy you are and allow you to identify the most trustworthy people. So here are just sort of these two systems, one for identifying the most trustworthy people to interact with, one for sort of creating a system that we're, that obviates a need for trust. And we sort of rely on both in today's modern economy. 
Well, although the the Chinese system, which which you know doesn't as as from everyone I've talked to, it doesn't really exist yet in that form. It's more like kind of a speculative, like maybe they'll go in that direction. But there are sort of uh, proxies to it, like like Alibaba has uh, a system that um, you know looks at just the data they have, right? Because you know Chinese users are even more profligate than than I think American uh, users in the sense of like just giving up all their data um, to uh, to the large firms and um, and just not worrying about it, or 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 if they do worry about it, they don't uh, not not enough that it would stop them from from using some of the essential services that they've all gotten used to online, um, but then. That means then they can kind of, you know, they have so much digital exhaust or whatever from everyone that they can, uh, you know, apply machine learning algorithms and without even necessarily understanding what it is that they're rewarding or punishing, kind of build up a score of you and find whether you're more or less likely to um, uh, to pay back a loan or make some estimate. I guess that, you know, and so the, the good side of that is maybe then someone who doesn't have a traditional credit score might be, um, you know, based on their purchase behavior or whatever it is, someone could say, could, I guess, get a sense of their true nature that maybe they are more likely to be someone who pays back their, um, their loans and they could get credit when they wouldn't otherwise. So sort of addressing a market failure. And then the downside though, is like, you could be sort of liable for who knows what, right? Whatever, whatever happened in your background that seems to be correlated in, in incredibly complex ways with, with non-payment, uh, could be held against you forever. Yeah, hundred percent. This credit score system, yeah, as you said, is mostly experimental. But this Alibaba thing you talked about—it's not just a Chinese thing; it's happening all over, right? In the, in the United States, we're grappling with this question of how much can your Facebook history be used against you, used for you or against you when giving you a job offer or not? How much can your social media history be used for you or against you? Um, in Europe, they've adopted these laws that ensure a right to privacy and a right to be forgotten, and that things you've done that are on the internet—you know—you have a right to erase um, at a certain point in time. Um, and so we are grappling this trade-off between like wanting to know who's trustworthy or not and people's right to privacy. Um, I think the reasons why we care about privacy is really interesting, right? I think privacy matters because we want to maintain a sense of personal autonomy, the ability to sort of, you know, make decisions without worrying about being watched all the time. Um, But that need for autonomy comes at odds with the need to identify who's trustworthy or not. Yeah, exactly. Like if I think about, you know, oh, right to be forgotten, that means someone someone could do something horrible and then you know uh, on the one hand there's sort of the the you know the concerns about cancel culture but going in the other extreme where someone can do anything they want and then you know have it wiped from the web doesn't seem uh doesn't seem optimal either yeah it's a trade-off right i mean i think think part of what we're worried about is like what happens when people make mistakes right what happens when like the image of ourselves on social media is not an accurate reflection of real life of course it's not and should should we allow companies to be basing decisions based on that artificial image. Even if it helps, you know, create better information in some cases, it could also lead to worse decisions in other cases. And society is grappling with how to balance those two things. Mm-hmm. So, um, okay, so you're talking about a lot of institutions that, you know, you're saying the development of the West is all about, like, building up institutions that allow us to trust more people. But, um, you know, I think a lot of us have the idea of, like, uh, you know, the sort of maybe imaginary good old days, but like, you know, people lived in homogeneous communities where everyone was from their same religious gr- group and the same ethnic group and everyone knew everybody else. And so, you know, you could leave your door unlocked all the time and, you know, uh, walk into your neighbor's house and borrow a cup of sugar and just tell them later and like no one would freak out. Like, so that that's sort of the the classic vision of high trust. So So how does that relate to this idea that like, like it, are, so who, who's more trusting? Is it modern societies or is it uh, this kind of uh, traditional you know, world to the extent that a, a world like that ever existed? Yeah, there's for sure this issue where diversity, you know, makes trust more difficult. Um, there's lots of, you know, just empirical evidence of that, that as societies get more diverse, you have just sort of less trust in our communities. Um, you know, sort of Putnam has looked at, looked at that in the context of the United States. Um, and that's a problem. And part of that comes because a lot of our institutions about trust are based on homog- homogeneity. A lot of religious institutions that create trust are based on creating trust for people like you who share the same religion, but by creating dis- 
mistrust of people dislike you, right? By sort of creating distrust of the other, we bring us together. Um, and that's a problem in our sort of pluralistic society today. Um, and that's something we should overcome because lots of evidence show that diversity is good for creativity. Diversity is good for innovation. And so we want to encourage diversity. We want to encourage cooperation across, you know, many diverse people in a globalized world. But we're stuck with a lot of these old habits, habits of thought that come from a time when trust was built on homogeneity. Um, and so I think that's, you know, something we need to contend with. Um, I think the other thing, though, that's that's a little more, more that's a little more optimistic um, is, is this evidence from these anthropologists uh, named Jean Ensminger and Joseph Enrich, which basically look at that what they want to try to do is they want to travel backward in time to see where we are trusting in the past um, compared to today. And of course, they don't have a time machine, but what they could do is they visited different societies around the world at different levels of market integration. So they looked at sort of the least market integrated societies. These are hunter-gatherer societies that still exist today. Then they moved to sort of a little more market integrated societies. These, these are subsistent farmers that maybe interact with the market a bit. And then they moved all the way up to sort of modern U.S. societies that interact with the market a lot. And what they did was they went to these places and they had them play trust games, games where people, you know, interact with each other, like the kinds of games I run in laboratories to measure trust. Um, and they expected there to be more trust in the past and less trust today. I think when I ask my students what they expect, I think most of my students expect the same thing, that in the past, when we lived in sort of small communities, we trusted each other more. In fact, they found the opposite, though. And the key reason they found the opposite was that the way we normally run these economic experiments is that we run them anonymously. You're always playing with somebody in a different room. And so you have in order. So for these games, we're measuring how much you trust an anonymous stranger. And it turns out that in sort of these old societies, that trust depended very much on knowing who you're interacting with, knowing are they one of these 150 people in your community that you know the reputation for. Um, and so it turns out that sort of in these hunter gatherer societies, they weren't very good at anonymous cooperation. And, and, and anonymous trust, whereas the most cooperative people in their sample was in the U.S., right? We think of the U.S. as sort of being very individualistic and very so sort of not community oriented. But it turns out that we're so used to trusting anonymous people in the United States that when it comes to sort of these anonymous trust games, we do relatively well. Um, and that gives me hope, right, that I think we've developed norms in Western industrialized culture that helps us trust anonymous institutions, that helps us trust like you know, the bank, the bank machine to get, to keep track of our money, right? There's, it's totally anonymous. There's nobody there. And yet we just trust it to work. And I think we sort of, and that's sort of the shift from trust being particularized to individual people to being generalized toward institutions as a whole. Yeah. I guess it kind of goes on with, uh, you know, the, the stereotype that, um, people from most other countries have of Americans, like we're always smiling and acting like everyone's our friend. And, uh, and it feels very insincere to them because like they know you should, you're not really friends with someone if you don't really know them. And maybe you have to have known them for years, but I guess maybe in a sense it is honest because we are kind of walking around hoping to make a new best buddy sitting next to us at the cafe or while waiting in line for the bank machine or, or all these other things. And uh, uh, so that there's that kind of general openness um, to, yeah, to, to cooperating in a sense with, with anyone who just, anyone who walks in the door. Right, exactly. And I think I, for me, that, that gives me hope, right? This idea that, you know, to solve the biggest problems of our time, like whether it's pandemics or climate change, we need to sort of like trust the institutions, trust complete strangers, right? Trust these abstract ideas like public health. Um, and I think we've, just, we've gotten better at doing that over time, not worse. And that at least that gives me hope for the future. But I think so. So, yeah, let's let's move on to that. So we've talked a lot about, you know, the the economy, um, you know, the many ways in which you you just take for granted that, you know, contracts will be fulfilled, that you're, you know, um, you walk into a hotel, the, you know, the bed will be clean. If it's not, you can complain about it, whatever. Um, but, uh, yeah, you, you also have a, a chapter in your book about trust in institutions. Um, and I feel like a lot of us feel um uh, you know, maybe without, it's not clear what the historical perspective or comparison point is, but a lot of people feel they, you know, have, uh, have been let down. There's less trust in politicians, less trust in media. Um, you know, the, the response to COVID has, has left, left some groups even feeling less trust in kind of science as a, as a endeavor or, um, or medicine. So, so I guess now that's a lot of different areas and they may each be different, but like, is, is there, is there more or less trust than there was in the past? And, and what 
can or should be done to to fix it or or make things better? Yeah, there was this. So the, I wrote the book, you know, ho- hoping to have an optimistic me- message. But there is one area of trust that sort of has not been so optimistic, especially in the past 50 years. And that's sp- specifically institutions surrounding expertise, right? That, you know, trust, like trusting institutions like the media, like science, like medicine, trust in those institutions have eroded over time. Um, I don't think it's as bad as people make, it, make them out to be. Um, trust in science actually has been relatively stable. Um, trust in other institutions like the military has actually gone up over time. But for sure, in some things, um, like trust in the media, trust in medicine, that's actually gone down. Um, And I worry about that a lot. (laughs) I think about what we can do about it. I think one reason for that distrust is just there's so much more information out there. And there's so much and there's so much more diversity of information out there that it's easy to sort of find arguments to sort of fit your fit your own private information. And you don't need you know, outside expertise anymore to decide, right? We all think we're like, you know, we, we all trust Dr. Google more than our own doctors sometimes in terms of diagnosing our health. Um, and so that's one reason for that distrust. I think the other reason for that distrust is there might, there seems to be more ideological segregation in the United States. It's not that our opinions have shifted that much. It's just they've sorted a lot more. And so Democrats are more like other Democrats. Republicans are more like other Republicans. And so it's, so we we might inc- we might trust our in groups more, but because we're now so more more and more different from the out groups, we sort of distrust the outsiders more. And so because a lot of these institutions are sort of made up of people in our out group, that sort of led to an increase of distrust in like Congress, like or, or in the media generally. Um, one thing I like to point out is we still trust the, you know, we still watch the news we trust. We just don't trust the media generally, right? We still trust our own congressmen. We don't trust Congress generally. We trust our own doctors a lot, but we don't trust we, we distrust medicine generally. Um, and that divergence between like our own priorities, our own interests, and the collective interests um, that has. You know that has diverged in the U.S. and also outside the U.S. also, um, and so I think that's something I worry quite a bit about. Right. So I mean, yeah, but you're saying that's increasing. I mean, I would imagine it would always have been the case to an extent for the same reason. You know, you, you when you have a personal relationship with someone and you know you're going to see them again, then you kind of expect that they're not going to mislead you or rip you off because if they do, then you'll find out about it and that that will destroy the relationship. Whereas like the kind of generalized anonymous, you know, uh, people out there like medicine in general, as opposed to like my doctor, um, you, you don't really know what, what their incentives are and you don't feel like they're beholden to you in the same way. Yeah, totally. Whenever we need, whenever we have theories of like sort of social change, I'm always interested in what the, what's the underlying material change, right? That's sort of like a very Marxist view of mine. That sort of all social change is due to under, you know, changes in the underlying substructure. And here, I think the changes are two things. One is the cost of information is way lower, right? We have just a lot more access about other doctors. Before you just sort of you knew your own doctor, and that's all you knew, and you didn't really think about other doctors elsewhere. But now we sort of are just more generally aware of the vast diversity of opinions out there. Um, and also just, you know, the, the national dialogue is much more relevant in our daily life, right? I think there's been a, basically there's a decrease in local news and an increase in national news consumption. And so we just are, we, we, we're just aware differently of just, you know, our individual doctor. And we're more aware that our individual doctor is less representative, maybe, of medicine as a whole. Um, and then the other thing is that travel costs are just lower now, right? It's easier to sort of move. Um, the nature of work has changed so that our workplaces are more ideologically segregated. It used to be that you'd have Republicans and Democrats working for the same company. Um, but now with like more outsourcing and more, um, you know, and, and just more you know, outsourcing tasks like custodial staff and whatnot, basically firms are more ideologically homogeneous and you're just less likely to encounter divergent views and views are just becoming. And so as a result, we're sort of, becoming less trusting of, you know, people at large and more focused on our own in-group and our own, you know, our own communities. Tell me more, more about corporations. I mean, I, I had a sense like geographically that there had been some focus and like, um, is, is it, is it like, uh, is there sorting within certain occupations like, uh, you know, tech people are one way and New York finance people are another way and, uh, you know, people working at uh, HMOs are a third way or, or, or is there even within like, there's going to be like the Republican bank and the Democrat bank. Yeah. I think it's sorting by profession mostly, right. Okay. That, you know, that, 
certain it was well, two things one thing is that we're, we, we've got we've become educationally more sorted right so that it, the more educated you are the more likely you are to be democrat um but also professions have, have always sort of been you know have always lent toward one and the other um and i think what's changed is that the nature of our workplaces have changed where workplaces have become more specialized right i think there was a recent new york times article comparing kodak and apple and looking at the janitor at kodak who was a kodak employee and worked his way up through the Kodak ranks and sort of did quite well at Kodak versus the janitor at Apple that worked for, you know, that was outsourced, that was part of some other separate company. So the Apple doesn't really, Apple employees don't really work with that janitor anymore. And so you just sort of have companies that are sort of more sorted by class, more sorted by education, and that just makes them more ideologically homogeneous than they used to be. Right. So, so it sounds like you're, um, I'm just thinking about like the, I was kind of raised in maybe the, uh, the, uh, you know, marketplace for ideas, I, you know, version. So it seems like this should be positive, right? If there's more information out there, we're not just like hearing whatever our local news channel, you know, and our local doctor is, but we can, we can listen to all of them and we can, you know, sort it out and figure out what the, the right answer is and get, you know, hear, you know, competing perspectives. Why, why is that, why would that decrease our trust? Yeah, I actually think that, that that in general, the internet and information is a good thing. I think people are very much worried about echo chambers that we see online. And yet a lot of the empirical evidence that I've seen recently is that actually we're pretty, we have a pretty heterogeneous diet of, of sort of social media consumption, that it's not as homogeneous as we think. Um, and so I don't think it's necessarily that, you know, all the information out there that is, you know, is, that is bad per se. Um, what I think actually is, it's the people we choose to interact with that's the main problem right i think i think social media has allowed us to sort of, sort of pick and choose the kinds of people we talk to um i think you know the workplace and, and the dynamics of the workplace means that the, the kinds of people that we talk to on, on a day-to-day basis of the water cooler is different than it used to be i think the way you know our we're geographically sorted means the sort of the, the people we interact with on a day-to-day basis um is different i think that's the main driver it's not Maybe the access to information that's that's the main problem. I think the main problem actually is just um, just you're not seeing these people, and we don't see these people. You sort of it's sort of it's, you're less likely to see them as human. Um, there's a lot of cool research recently about the contact hypothesis, um, looking at things like why did attitudes toward gay marriage shift so fast? Why did attitudes toward trans rights shift so fast? And the main finding, as it seems, is that people now know a gay person. Right, that wasn't true 20, 30 years ago. 20 or 30 years ago, when they may have known a gay person, but that person was closeted. Now that people are much more likely to know a gay person, then people are more likely to see them as human and more likely to be accepting of, of them. But I think the opposite has happened ideologically. Right. We're, we're just less likely to know somebody who's ideologically different than us. Um, the number that really gets me is that uh, in, 2020, in 2020, only 4% of marriages were between a Democrat and a Republican. Um, and that I found to be just really shocking that we just don't interact with each other in the same way that we used to. How, what did it used to be? Uh, not to put you on the spot, but do you remember roughly? <laughs> I don't know. I think in this particular study, they only have like four years of data and it used to be higher four years ago. Um, but I'm, I am curious. I don't know what it was before that. Yeah. I mean, certainly, yeah, it does seem like yeah a lot smaller. I suspect there was, uh, yeah, maybe in the old days you wouldn't even have to like, I don't know. I don't even know if you'd, uh, you'd talk about it for like 60 years ago, maybe the man just assumed the wife was going to vote like him and then not, uh, um, not even ask. Um, but, uh, that now, now that people are more independent, maybe there's more like, yeah, people actually stand up for their views. And so if they're sharply discordant, that um, can cause problems and they don't end up getting married. But yeah, uh, but yeah mean, but the, the fact increase... that that's, yeah, go ahead. No, the increase in sorting, for sure, there's a lot of research on um, how there's more educational homophily in marriages, right? That it used to be more likely for like a college educated man to marry a, a high school educated secretary. Um, and, you know, and, the, and and people find that actually a big source of the increase in, in inequality in past years is that now a college educated man is more likely to marry a college educated woman. And that sort of concentrates the wealth in fewer people. And I'm, I imagine because college education is also correlated with ideology. Um, that also probably, that, that also contributes to concentrating the ideology and you know in different marriages. Huh. Although I guess I, it doesn't seem like we should be nostalgic for the old days when like the the big the big rich boss would would marry the working girl secretary and like and given that the power imbalance that uh, that would 
I think often existed in those marriages. Um, but, but yeah, it no, is. For sure. I agree. Yeah, yeah I agree. But then, yeah, but then, it, yeah, even if we say, okay, yeah, you should, yeah, it kind of makes sense to, you know, marry. But yeah, on the other hand, it sounds very classist to say you should marry your edu- your equal, even if you're only terming defining that as educational as opposed to like, uh, uh, you know, wealth or you know, being nobility or something. If we take it back a few hundred years, um, yeah, yeah, in some anyway, ways, I do, yeah, I have nothing. In some ways, ideological sorting's fine, right? You know, people like hanging out with people that are like them. And I think it's great that you could go online now and find people that love the same band as you, or love the same obscure sport, or love the same obscure you know art or something. I think all that's great. I just wish we had more institutions that sort of crossed lines. Um, Putnam famously had this thing, you know, had this book called Bowling Alone, where he sort of reminisces about a time when we had bowling leagues that would bring people together from sort of different classes and different you know ideologies into the same group. Um, and I sort of think that might be useful. Um, I was on this, I, I testified for this congressional panel on national service. And I think one thing that national service would do really well is if we had mandatory national service, it would be an institution that brought us together. Um, so I'm not saying that every institution should be homo, you know, should bring people, diverse people together, but it's great when it happens and, and we should have more of them. Yeah, I definitely feel like my life has been different from, you know, when I was in you know, growing up, I was in public school and, you know, some of the kids there went on to, you know, get PhDs, at least like maybe me and one or two others in, in my class, but like other kids, you know, just graduated from high school and then, you know, went into military or, uh, you know, became janitors or, you know, went to community college or, or a variety of different outcomes. And, um, you know, I, I definitely, you know, could see could see my, my future in the sense that I did bond more with the people who, um, you know, were, were uh, very academic in their orientation, but, um, but at least I knew some of the other people, you know, I had them in my classes and like, I, you know, I understood them as, as humans and, and interacted with them. Um, yeah. And I, and I do feel like there's a lot of, uh, my, you know, our daily lives now that's, uh, that's much more isolated that way. Um, that yeah, was interesting. Actually, I was just good. talking to you, I was just getting a haircut, um, in, in my yard, uh, you know, with, in my yard with masks on, with everyone vaccinated, because I'm, that's how paranoid I'm feeling today. Um, but uh, with but and the um, our hitters, we were talking about the um, the California election, and uh, men, we were talking about one, you know one of the candidates, um, Caitlyn Jenner, and uh, I guess that that's sort of a, a rare example of someone who who does diverge from their community in the sense that you know uh, Caitlyn is a very diehard Republican who wants to replace Gavin Newsom and is, you know, their entire friend community is trans people who are much, you know, pretty much very anti-Republican and, and democratic. So, but you don't, but you don't see much of that. You know, you pretty much 99% of the time, if you see someone who's, you know, trans or gay, I mean, the good thing is, you know, also, I guess with the internet, you can, those people can form communities and, and, that's probably part of why there's been more acceptance because they've been able to like form critical mass and get to know each other and feel comfortable then, you know, revealing their views and experiences to the world. Um, but yeah, but then you get this, uh, this homogeneity so that, so someone like Caitlyn Jenner really stands out as, as an exception. Yeah. I love seeing that people that defy stereotypes like that. I think we should have more of that. And I, I think that there probably are more people like that and some of them are just afraid to show it. Right. I think, you know, we have this pressure for conformity, which makes sense. Right. Because, you know, like I said, a lot of trust comes from conformity. Um, One thing in particular I worry about is there's all this research that shows that, you know, one reason why we have so much outrage is because outrage builds trust. Right. And that if, you know, and this maybe performative outrage we sort of see is just is important to people because it helps get people who are like minded to trust them. Um, And. The worry is that you get people sort of just like, you know, performing outrage as a way to build trust, even if, even if they don't really believe it. And you sort of like hide the diversity of opinion that underlies it just because we're in this equilibrium where, you know, it's necessary to sort of show how outraged you are all the time. Right. And you have to show that you're outraged about the the correct things um, to the correct people. Yeah, right, it's, exactly. it's tricky. Um, so so one one last thing, a little bit uh, on a slightly different to- topic. Um, I was noticing, you know, as you're as you um, in the book, so you, uh, you, you talked at the start a lot about your own research on apologies, but like, you're, you're really trying to synthesize a lot of different, um, studies there. And that's, you know, a, a great aspect of the book, um, uh, why I'm going to assign it for one of my classes this, this fall. Cause I think it just, you know, gives, uh, 
a quick overview of a lot of different things going on in behavioral economics, institutional economics, and kind of ties them together um, in a in a coherent way. Um, but one of the things you do you do tie together there is you, you mention a lot of psychology lab studies, um, and and I, I can't speak to any of the ones that you cited specifically, but. Um, you know, I've been hearing a lot about the reproducibility crisis in psychology, right? The, the worry is that professors take groups of college students in labs and then just keep running experiments on them until they get something, kind of rolling the dice so, till they get something that has statistical significance, or they change, you know, measure 50 different outcome variables and interaction terms and all this stuff until they get an answer that, that again, would be statistically legitimate if that was the only test they've been running, and then they can go publish it. Um, so, so how do you, how did you think about that as you, uh, you know, went through trying to synthesize and like say, okay, here's what we know about trust when so many of the well-known studies have been have been challenged in various ways or, or at least had suspicion cast on them. Yeah, I think the replication crisis, which started in psychology, right? But I think it's pervasive everywhere. Um, so the replication crisis, as you mentioned, is this realization that a lot of like the most well-known studies um, in psychology, but other disciplines just can't be replicated. Um, they recently went and like picked out a hundred of the sort of most well-known psych studies from a couple of years and tried to replicate all of them. And they found only about one third of them replicated, two thirds did not. Um, econ, they did the same thing. Econ did a little bit better, two thirds replicated, but that still means one third did not. Um, they did similar things in like in medicine and cancer studies. And they found even in those cases, you know, lots of studies did not replicate. Um, like comparable amounts of psychology. So this is definitely not a psychology problem. Um, I think one way is that you have to look at the whole literature. I, I, when I talked about apologies, I talked about how I approach them, you know, not just through like one method, like lab experiments, but through lab experiments and game theory and field experiments and econometric studies. Um, and I think that helps lend credibility. Um, I think the other thing is that I think people maybe fret too much about these, this replicability problem, right? I think it is true that a lot of these classic lab studies don't replicate, but sometimes they sort of still reveal a useful truth. Um, I think one example that c comes up a lot is this famous like Zimbardo prison experiment. Um, this is the experiment at Stanford where they put a bunch of uh, college students in a basement and told them to act like prison guards. Um, and it turned out that once they act like prison prison guard, they, once they're acting like prison guards, they became cruel and sadistic. And the idea is that like just acting like a prison guard can make you cruel and sadistic. And people have pointed out that this was a really poorly run study, right? It was just it had a lot of biases in so many different ways. But I do think the general ideas in there are still useful. Um, I think when I learned psychology uh, you know, at Stanford, actually, so maybe they're biased, but they told me that in some ways you shouldn't worry too much about the details of the study. Sometimes the study is just a story and you have to, you have to think, does this story make sense? Um, and of course, you should be skeptical of all evidence. I am skeptical of any new study, right? I think my, my general baseline based on these replication studies is that any study, regardless, is it a medicine study or a psychology study or econ study? My baseline is that it's probably wrong. Um, but if you start seeing, you know, re repeated evidence over and over again from many different places, if it tells a story that sort of fits in your mental model, then I think you can start believing something. And that's how I approach understanding research. Hmm. Sounds a little bit verging on like kind of a truthiness kind of argument. Like if it feels true, then, you know, because I mean, certainly the complaint from the other side is like, we're, 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 especially if you hear certain famous studies getting repeated over and over again, we kind of with something that may actually be a spurious or, you know, slightly randomly spurious or maybe even constructed argument where like the guy knew what he wanted from his study before he did it, then like, is that, is it's, it's even, 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 you know, understanding that like the scientific process is much more iterative and looser than kind of the, the ninth grade, you know, hypothesis testing thing that we all learned. Um, still still raises it makes me feel some qualms i guess yeah i think but i guess i always think that we should not undervalue the importance of intuition one of my favorite books is this book by james c scott seeing like a state where he talks about that knowledge comes in like techna which is like technical knowledge and metis which is like this greek word for wisdom and that oftentimes by focusing too much on technical knowledge we don't appreciate how important uh, you know wisdom is um, you know, in, in his book, Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell has a lot of popularized studies about how often intuition does a lot better than, you know, technical scientific knowledge. And I think 
I think there's a role there. Of course, we should not. Of course, our intuition can be very biased, right? So Outliers also has lots of examples of how our intuition leads to very bad biased results. And I don't have a clean answer as to when intuition's good and when intuition's bad, except that I know it's necessary. Um, like I was, you know, in, in some ways, knowing like science is about knowing who to trust. And when people say trust the science, it's like, OK, well, it's like which scientists? Everything we know in science is really just about what someone tr who, who we trust told us. Um, I sort of I sort of think of I, 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 I tell a story about how I was driving across country once. Um, and, you know, I, I normally normally listen to NPR. And um, at some point, NPR wasn't around anymore. And I found this other talk radio station where the scientist was giving giving a very eloquent explanation about creationism and how, you know, humans are only 5,000 years old. And it all sounded really reasonable to me. Um, and it, it struck me that, like, the reason we believe in evolution, the reason we believe in quarks, the reason we believe in everything scientific, is just someone we trusted told us that. Um, and I think it just makes us better appreciate how important, how elusive, um, you know, truth is, right? Truth is really based on who we trust. And I find that idea really valuable. Yeah, yeah. I often think about that when people talk about ad, ad hominem arguments. It's like, you know, there's just so many things where like, I trust the argument, not because I have time to like, dig into the studies or let alone the whole literature and the methodology, especially if it's like outside of social science, where I lack training, you know, so yeah, it really is going to come down to like, you know, I guess it's a person at a famous institution who, you know, has not had any lawsuits against them, or, you know, had their papers kicked out of the major journals. So probably it's, you know, probably it's legit. So I guess I've you know, just got to go with it. But it's very much, you know, it's the reverse of that ad, ad hominem by the same token, like if you tell me that person's bad or sneaky or whatever, then if I don't trust them, I'm probably not going to trust the, the things that, you know, the arguments that they made, even if those arguments seem plausible, as far as I can tell. Yeah, um, I, 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 exactly. Like, I really think we don't appreciate the importance of just the hominem, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> that, you know, I think evolution has given us lots of, um, you know, ha has given us a really keen ability to decide who is trustworthy and who is not. It's often easily misled, right? But there's all these sort of studies that look at how we can sort of tell how, you know, how nice your doctor will be just based on four seconds of interaction or eight seconds of interaction. We could, we know, we could predict, you know, what, uh, what a professor's course evaluations will be just based on an eight second video clip. And so it's because we, we are keenly attuned to who's trustworthy and who's not that we could tell these things. And I think we're better at that part than evaluating scientific evidence, right? That like, you know, people want us to sort of read the science about climate change and you should, it's good to know, but really to expect anybody, including myself, right? I've read the thousand page UN IPCC report. That doesn't mean I know what's right or what's wrong, right? It sounds right to me, but it sounds right to me because I trust them, not because like I know the science enough to think that this is the truth. Um, and you know, this is somebody, you know, yeah, with a PhD who spent a lot of time doing this. It's unreasonable to expect everybody to be reading all these reports and getting a PhD's worth of knowledge just to decide what to believe. And yet we all must vote <laughs> and, yeah. and live our lives. Um, all right. Well, um, this has been fascinating. Um, so, you know, definitely uh, encourage everyone to, um, you know, go out and get the book. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask before we close up, uh, what, what are you working on now? I know you're doing a lot, obviously, to, to promote the book and, uh, um, you know, prepping for classes and everything else. But uh, what's your next research project? Yeah, a couple low key projects. One is basically um, looking at Among Us. I don't know if you know the game Among Us. It was this game that was super my popular. Kids are, yeah, one of my kids got really into it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a game where basically there's a collection of players, and one of them is a traitor. And that traitor, and I, the goal is each the, the people have to get together and vote at the end of each round to decide who the traitor is. And there's this there's this like chat period where people negotiate and make accusations, and then they vote. And I think I've always been fascinated on like who do you believe? Right, it's all cheap talk. And so who do you believe is a traitor? Who do you believe is a guilty party? Um, and so I've spent the summer basically collecting data from Among Us games and building a game theory model to be, basically better understand understand who you believe in terms of these accusations and cheap talk oh wow i'm really excited. I'm, I'm excited to tell my uh, tell my son about that he'll think you're so cool i just made him take a game theory course this summer so um now now even more uh i'm, I'm going to turn him into an economist uh despite despite his mom's uh best uh, best intentions <laughs> for him to learn something productive and uh 
and less boring in his life. Um, all right. So, uh, yeah, that, that's really cool. Um, uh, I was not expecting to hear that and that's super fun. Um, all right. So that, that's about all the time we have really appreciate you uh, coming on the show. Um, I really enjoyed uh, having a chance to talk to you, with you uh, about this. Yeah. Thanks very much, Peter. It was a lot of fun.